1918, First World War draws to an end. Millions die in the trenches. Thousands return home. For many, there are no jobs. 1920, economic crisis grips Europe in the aftermath of war. 1924, the Labour Party gains power for the first time. Unemployment stands at one million. 1926, general strike. Trade unionists defy attempts to cut wages. 1928, economic slump that has already hit Germany spreads around the world. 1929, second Labour government elected. Unemployment stands at one and a half million. 1930, unemployment jumps to two million. Wall Street crashes and companies collapse around the world. In Britain, Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald and his government face a grave crisis. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Privy Seal, in the 11 months since the election of this Labour government, we have witnessed a rise in the number of wholly unemployed from one to two millions. Two million able-bodied men and women unable to find gainful employment is the legacy to date of our socialist policies. Mosley, we are all aware of your concern for these wretched people's lot. It is a concern which I, as Prime Minister, share with these, my fellow ministers. Then why has not anything been done about it? Why have we not got an effective policy to deal with this problem of unemployment? Might I be so bold as to suggest that Sir Oswald gives us a brief summary of the measures he intends to take? It's a timely suggestion, Philip, one which I was about to propose myself. Sir Oswald. Let me say first that I do not put forward any of my proposals as a final solution, but simply to provoke the necessary debate and discussions which you so far have failed to make. First of all, I propose the spending of 200 million pounds on a new road building scheme. Secondly, the lowering of the old age pension from 65 to 60 as advocated by the miners. And thirdly, the raising of the school leaving age from 14 to 15. These three measures alone will release at least a further 700,000 jobs for the wholly unemployed to take up. However, they must be seen in the context of a broader economic vision. Excuse me for interrupting, but where do you intend financing these projects mm. from? We can't splash money around like water, you know. By nationalizing the banks, Mr. Chancellor, and pursuing an economic policy of expansion, by imposing import controls, and by expanding our home market, by creating a high-powered government elite of four or five ministers who will work side by side with experts, scientists, technicians, researchers, economists, don't you understand? We're living at the dawn of the scientific age and we must change to harness these new forces. This is something approaching insanity. It's bloody rubbish. You'll see. In due course, fresh markets will open overseas to absorb our surplus production and all will be well. I agree with you, Philip. A trade revival is just around the corner. Mr. Thomas, unemployment is the overriding problem facing this nation and requires the mobilization of all our forces, as in war. We will not be pushed into shoveling out public money merely for the purpose of taking a small number of people off the unemployment register. Merely, Mr. Chancellor. Don't you understand that the unemployed are our responsibility? I believe in state intervention in our national affairs. We believe in letting things take their course. Your measures will create inefficiency and so impede the natural forces of recovery. And these are the arguments of socialism's opponents. You are misunderstanding us, Oswald. Oh, no, Mr. Prime Minister. I think perhaps I misunderstood you when I came into this Labour government. You're terrified of using the power you've been entrusted with. And you're a bloody commie. You're a red. If you had your way, you'd have the Russians in the government with us. What? Look, leave me alone. I'd sooner take my chances with unemployment than be bullied into employment by the likes of you. I find that I am the only socialist here present. I am appalled by your lack of will to overcome these difficulties. It appears, Mr. Thomas, that it is even impossible to have the relevant issues properly discussed. The only course of action left open to me is to resign from His Majesty's government herewith. To bring these grave matters to the test, I intend appealing directly to the House of Commons. In resigning from His Majesty's government, I am not unaware of the necessity for this nation to be mobilized and rallied for a tremendous effort. And who can make that effort but the government of the day. 
If that effort is not made, we may soon come to a crisis, to a real crisis. What this government must do is to come before Parliament with an unemployment policy. If its proposals are thrown out, then the government must go to the country and fight its opponents on the question of unemployment. At best, it would win its majority. At worst, it would go down fighting for something that it believed in. It would not die like an old woman in the bed. It would die like a man in the field. I do not believe that this great national crisis is a menace to the Labour government. It is our supreme opportunity. With courage, vigor, vision, decision, and a policy, we could use this situation to remodel the whole structure of our country. Let us not shrink before a great opportunity. Let us not shrink in fear before it. Let us seize it and use it and give the country a lead. This is the BBC from London. The time is 10 o'clock. The Prime Minister of Great Britain, her empire and dominions, and leader of the Labour Party, will now broadcast to the nation. Fellow countrymen, good evening. As you will now be aware, at 10.35 p.m. last night, I tendered my resignation to His Majesty the King. It was refused. At a further conference this morning, it was agreed to form a government of national unity with the Liberal and Conservative parties. I strove until almost the last sand in the glass had gone through to keep the Labour government in office. I failed. Now this new national government has to be constructed as quickly as possible. There is no time to lose. The country's unemployment figures stand at nearly three million, and the new government must be free to consider every proposal likely to help. I appeal to all classes and all conditions to go cheerfully with the government over the hard and broken road which lies ahead. Consequently, the first measure we are introducing is a reduction of 10% in the rates of benefit for the unemployed. Uh, the new rates will be paid for the first six months of unemployment only. Thereafter, benefit will be available subject to a household means test. It is far better for us all to go with tight belts into stability than with loose ones into confusion. I wish you all good night. I don't know what you're waiting for. I won't take your charity, so you might as well leave. Well, there's nothing else. Nothing else? What do you mean, nothing else? Work is what we want. There's a factory standing idle outside the back door. There's 30 men in this street alone wanting work. And you stand there and tell me there's nothing else. And I paid my contributions, you know. Even when I was sick, I paid them. So don't try and tell me I'm not entitled to draw a benefit. I know my rights, and you can't change them. No, Mr. Harris, I can't. But what I've been trying to tell you for the last half hour is the government can. After six months' unemployment, you are no longer entitled to draw full benefit, and you and your family must be placed onto poor relief, assistance. But if it's all so simple, why all the questions? Why can't you just give us what we were getting before? Well, the facts of the matter are quite simple. You see, the unemployment fund is no longer able to cope with the needs of all those out of work. The government has therefore had to find a new way of dealing with them. Now, it's my job to try to put the new system into operation. But what about the money he's paid in every week? What's happened to that? Why can't we have that? It's ours, not theirs. There isn't enough money left to go round, Mrs. Harris. Now, look, we're all having to make sacrifices at the moment. Look, we've been on the breadline for nearly six months now. So don't come here telling us to do our bit. Have you ever tried living on 25 bob a week when you've a family to feed? At least on benefit, I know I've earned some of the money I bring home. And you come in here and you tell me I've got to take charity from a government that doesn't know its ass from its elbow. What kind of justice is that? Get out, will you, and take your charity with you. Very well. If that's the no. way you feel that... We'll answer your question. We will not! Look, we've got to eat. And there's the rent to pay, and where's the money coming from? 
He says there'd be no more benefit. We can't live on thin air with three mouths to feed. Oh, I know it's hard on you, but there's no other way. What is it you want to know? It's bloody cold standing here. They'll be open in a minute. You'll be lucky. 8.30 on the dot. They're in no rush. It's nice and warm in there. Hey, I wouldn't mind a job in Labour Exchange myself. You'll never be out of work, that's a certainty. How long have you been out of work? About six months now. Catching me up? Oh, come on, open up! Oh, no, what's she gonna mouth about? Workers' Revolution or some other bloody rubbish? They're all the same. Come on in, love, give us a song, cheer us up. How about the red flag? Will that do? No, uh, show us a bit of leg instead, eh? They certainly wouldn't cheer you up. We'll let you know. What I would like to do is ask you a question. Who do you think is most affected by these new cuts? Is it the rich, with their big houses and their full stomachs? Is it the politicians? No, it's you, standing in this queue without job to a suffering. How long have you been unemployed? So long! Yes, it is too long. But what are the government doing about it? Are they creating new jobs through nationalisation and public work schemes? Are they making any attempt to reduce unemployment? What they are doing is increasing your hardship by subjecting you to the means test. And why? Because their economies can't cope with unemployment. They expect you to accept charity and be grateful. Well, what's the point talking about it? Exactly. Let's do something. Why don't you do something like push off? Oh, come on. Give her a chance. Look, it's not me. I'm not telling you what to do. It's the voice of the unemployed all over the country saying we must take action now. So the National Unemployed Workers' Movement are organising a national hunger march to London to show the strength of the unemployed. We will show this government that we will no longer accept this situation. Now what I want you to do is to join with us, increasing our numbers and making your voices heard. Now I've told you before, miss, you're not making your speeches outside labour exchanges. But why not? These people are entitled Now I don't to... need to tell you that. Will you move on? I believe I have a right to speak wherever I choose. Very well, then I'll have to arrest you for provoking a breach of the peace. Now I ask you, am I committing a breach of the peace by speaking to you this morning? It's an offence to use threatening, abusive or insulting words or behaviour to provoke a breach of the peace. Oh, come on, give her a chance to speak. The revolution hasn't started yet. Nobody asked for your opinion. Now, I've told you, miss, I don't want any trouble on my patch. Will you move on? There is nothing wrong in peaceful demonstration. We have a right to express our views. I haven't got time to stand here arguing, you know. Now move. If she hasn't done anything wrong. She's just speaking her mind. It's enough from you. Do you know that the police have used baton charges and mounted police against defenceless people demonstrated because they're hungry? Right. If that's the way you want it. Hey, now, come on. Leave her alone. If you're out of work, you'd have a Are bit you more sympathy. Are you going to stand out of my way, sir? Well, why should I? She's only trying to speak. Look, What's wrong I've with that? I've told the young lady why she has to move. If you stand him away, you'll only get yourself into trouble. Give her a chance just because you don't want to hear it. Right. I've had enough of the pair of you. Hey, now, look. Come if, on. She, if she goes, I go too. Right. I'll take you both in. Oh, oh no, that's ridiculous. Why don't you go and catch a few criminals instead of doing this, you My dear friends, today, as you know, I lunched with Morris, the motor car man, and I have some good news to tell you because of it. A check. A check for £50,000 to launch a new political party. Our new party. And here it is. Morris has read a copy of our manifesto and calls it a ray of hope. So saying, he took out his checkbook, handed over the 50,000, adding, don't think, my boy, that money like this grows on gooseberry bushes. The first 10,000 took a great deal of getting. <laughs> you bet it did. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? Well, John, the moment for our great adventure has arrived. The nation is demanding action from us now. We've only to stand forward as the young standard bearers of hope for the people in their thousands to start flocking to us. Oswald is absolutely right. The Labour Party is going to rack and ruin, and we have to organise an alternative to the chaos, because they're incapable of doing it. Quite. It's not only a new economic policy. It's a new character and order of resolution that is needed. We've got to break out of this intolerable class deadlock we've been led into. We've got to unite workers and employers together in our new industrial party. No, no, Oswald, you're getting carried away again. No, sure. No, you forget. It's been left up to me to win over all the other Labour MPs. Now, to many of them, what we are proposing is simply not oh, socialism. Now, come on, John. You know as well as I do that our support comes from MPs of all parties, united by a common belief in a new order that will drag this country, albeit kicking and screaming, into the 20th century. But not regardless of cost. 
If our new party carries on the way it is going, then all the workers will get from us are empty phrases and reductions in their wages. But what are the real facts confronting us today? That our new party can proceed at the behest of a self-made multi-millionaire, Sir William Morris, who has deigned to throw in a 50,000 pound crumb from off his Savoy grilled table. Couldn't there be just the smallest element of self-interest behind this great gesture? Are we not already being used by big business for its own ends? I put it to you, Oswald, that you are already in their pockets. For you're a different man to the one I rose and cheered to the echo when you so courageously resigned. Your faith has left you. You're acquiring a dangerously reactionary mind. It's a reversion to type, as should be expected with all the aristocracy. And with it, I detect the first faint whiff of fascism in this room tonight. If I am right, then we can fight together no longer. I wish you all good night. So, my friend, we can be but thankful that the loss of such a faint hearted element in our midst has been so painless. The pretensions of these international socialists are beyond belief. Are we to wait for higher wages and full employment until socialism comes to Timbuktu? <laughs> no. We are putting Britain first and acting now. Our new party will stand for youth. Our new party will stand for action. Our new party will be the modern movement. Oh no, my friends. We are not going into the political wilderness. We are going to fertile pastures. New. Miss Watson, would you tell the court what you were saying to these people outside the Labour Exchange? I was speaking about the cuts and the unemployment benefits, which I think are unjust. And were you speaking as an individual or on behalf of an organisation? I was speaking as an individual member of the community and also as a member of the National Unemployed Workers uh, This is a communist organisation. Some members are communists. Including yourself? Yes. And as a communist, what were you suggesting that these people do about the cuts? I suggested that they join a national hunger march to London. So your organisation thinks that it knows better than a government that was elected by the people of this country? This government has betrayed the people of this country. Thank you. I don't think we want any communist speeches here. I think you have made your position quite clear. George Albert Harris. Had you ever seen Miss Watson before this incident outside the Labour Exchange? I don't remember seeing her, no. But you knew when you obstructed the police officer that you were aiding a communist. It didn't matter to me what her politics were. But by your action, you were supporting what she was saying. Look, she was trying to say something to the crowd, and I thought the policeman had no right to stop but her. But you knew that what she was saying was communist propaganda, you, did you not? You wouldn't think it was propaganda if you'd had your doll money cut by 10%. That's hardly the point, Mr. It, it is the point, but you don't care, do you? You've never been on the doll. Mr. You're never Hatt bloody well likely Mr. to be. Hatt It is obvious to me, from the way you have behaved in court today, and from the way you acted to impede a police constable in the execution of his duty, that you have no regard for the forces of law and order that operate in this country. It is bad enough that you are unemployed, but then to take action in support of the defendant here, who has openly confessed to be a communist, and therefore antagonistic towards the government of this country, is a matter of a most serious nature. As for you, Miss Watson, the activities of both you and your organisation in provoking unemployed men and women to take the law into their own hands is both irresponsible and unpatriotic. Now, this court intends to do all it can to stop people from taking part in these demonstrations. I therefore sentence you Just both... Just a minute. To... Aren't we allowed to say something before you pass sentence? I don't think that will be necessary, Mr Harris. But it... It's our right to say something if we want to. Very well. Proceed. Well, f first of all, I think it's a disgrace that the legal system of this country is used to try and stop people from speaking their minds. Now, she may be a communist, 
But at least she's trying to do something to bring the problems of working people to the attention of the government. Thank you, Mr. Now, Harris. Look, I'm not a communist. I I've told you that. But I I'll tell you, I'm glad she spoke outside the Labour exchange because she's helped me to make up my mind what I'm going to do. I'm going to march with the National Unemployed Workers Movement. I'm going to march with them to London. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything to add, Miss Watson? No, because I fear Mr. Harris has said what the unemployed are saying all over the country. It doesn't matter what political party you belong to. It's what you do that's important, not what you say. 25 shillings fine each and bound over to keep the peace for 12 months. Next. I, Ronald James Johnson, being the electoral returns officer for the constituency of Stoke-on-Trent, do hereby announce that the result of the parliamentary by-election is as follows. Mr. Ellis Smith, Labour Party candidate, 13,264 votes. Mrs. Ronald Copeland, National Government candidate, 19,918 votes. Sir Oswald Mosley, New Party candidate, 10,534 votes. Mrs. Ronald Copeland is therefore elected as parliamentary candidate for the said constituency. in the queue then? Yeah. What's it like to be a free man again? I wasn't inside. 25 bob fine and bound over. Hey, that's a week's money. How are you going to pay that? Better watch your step next time, eh? What? Well, you're not going to get a job if they find you mixing with that lot. What are you talking about? Oh, come on. Your friends in the National Unemployed, whatever it is, they won't get you a job, will they? Not unless it's in Moscow, I eh? can't talk to who I like. Yeah, all right. That's all it is, though, talk, isn't it? What this country needs is action. We'll get action if we all stick together. Oh, come on. Now, look, there's your man. Who, Mussolini? No, Mosley. Look, Mosley speaks the fascist leader in Italy. Two of a kind. Yeah, two true, mate. Men of action. Not like you and your red friends shouting at the government. Because Mosley was the only MP who gave a damn, wasn't he? And he resigned. Mm. And look at him now. A full-time election loser. Elections? Mussolini didn't need elections, did he? Marched on Rome with a bloody army. Kick some sense into him. So we'll march on London. Yeah, but he marched with guns, not a bloody petition. And if Mosley's any sense, he'd come back here and do the same. Is that what you want, then? Fascism? Look, mate, I don't care if it's Arsenal Football Club if it'll get me a job. Look what Mussolini's done for Italy. Yes, I know. He's got the trains running on time. But what about the rest, hmm? He's smashed the trade unions, cut wages, and if you don't like it, bang, straight into prison. I'll tell you, you're better off standing in this stole queue than living over there. Who told you that? You can't be friends. Yeah, well, maybe they know what they're talking about. No, mate. It's the way they work. I'll tell you, it's the Reds in the government that are ruining this country. And Mosley got out, because he's an Englishman. He puts England first. Oh, look who needs Mosley. You're a bloody fascist yourself. Maybe. But what I am now is a loser. 
and I'm fed up of standing on this queue watching England go down the drain. All right, if Mosey's the only one who cares enough to give us jobs, I'll follow him. I'll take my orders from an Englishman, thank you. Not from Moscow. I'm not taking any orders from Moscow. I wouldn't know, comrade, but you better choose which side you're on. Otherwise, you might find yourself getting cleared out with the rest of the rubbish. Right? 